Good morning, everyone, again. Um, he would, here we are for our second panel of this morning, a panel on Atlantic diasporas. I'm uh, very glad to have here with me three very distinguished speakers. Professor Dul Scott from Anderson University in the United States, who will present on Portuguese Americans, Assimilation and Diaspora. Uh, Professor Denis Borges from CSU, California State University, The Dream You Were Denied, The Azorian Diaspora Bridges, the Atlantic and the Pacific, and Professor Daniela Melo from Boston University, also in the United States, with U.S. foreign policy during the Portuguese Revolution, uh, diasporic activism, and the Azores question. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we will follow the order of the program, and I will ask each speaker to use no more than 15 minutes so we can keep the schedule of our program. Thank you very much, Luz. Uh, good morning. Okay. Uh, thank you for organizing such a wonderful event, and that was one extra minute. Um, <laughs> Uh, classical assimilation theory predicts that within three generations or so, the descendants of immigrants will be fully integrated into American society and will no longer identify with the country of ancestral origin. This theory was developed over 100 years ago to interpret the experience of immigrants and their descendants in their path of integration into American society. It has had several reiterations in the last 100 years. Diaspora theory, on the other hand, predicts the opposite. The main, uh, and in order to have a diaspora, you need to have the maintenance of the <coughs> distinct communities, uh, as well as ethno-national identities that are ethnic in nature, transnationalism in relation to the homeland and other diaspora communities in other countries, uh, the development of trans-state networks first connecting with the homeland, the homeland is a major concept in diaspora theory, and later with co-ethnics in other areas of the diaspora. Immigration as from Portugal has been decreasing since the 1980s. As you can see, we had less than 1,000 per year from 2010 to 2019. And I just read an article whereby at, at least 10,000 people immigrated from Portugal to Switzerland just last year. Um, in as much as new immigration renews ethnic communities, this is not a positive development for the future of diaspora in the, of the Portuguese diaspora in the United States. Uh, when just focus on the chart, when we look at different Portuguese American groups, we see that both the number of immigrants from Portugal and Luso descendants born in the US are in decline. However, the number of immigrants from other Portuguese diaspora communities is increasing rapidly. About 60% of them is, are coming from Brazil, from the Portuguese diaspora communities in Brazil. And there's a lot of others coming from Mexico, from Cuba, from Venezuela. And that's why Spanish is the second most spoken language, I'd say third, next to English and Portuguese, among Portuguese Americans. They're also coming from uh, South Africa, a slew of Asian countries, several European countries, Canada, Bermuda, and so forth. So that's the, the population that is increasing. But the question with this population is, what is the homeland for them? Again, a very important concept in diaspora. If I am from Brazil, is the homeland Portugal or is the homeland Brazil? If I'm from Japan, when we have Portuguese, Japanese in, in the United States, is Japan the homeland or is it Portugal? Also, do people born in these other countries identify with the Portuguese American communities, people from the Azores, the continent of Portugal, and the reverse, do we identify them also as being Portuguese? And are we willing to engage together in 
uh, diaspora community building activities. Having said that, the Portuguese remain highly concentrated in the states of traditional settlement, which were uh, California, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. All of these traditional states have been experiencing population decline. People are moving to some extent. Florida has been the state that has increased the most in terms of um, Portuguese Americans. And um, now within uh, these states, we have a little bit of a population concentration. My friend Denise will tell you that's still too far to keep communities going. But, uh, you know, Florida is huge. I mean, California is huge. Uh, but you do see some concentration of Portuguese Americans. This is a map I did of the cities with 100 and more Portuguese uh, in uh, California for a presentation I did for the niche. And then you see this concentration also in Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, uh, Portuguese Americans are much more concentrated, so it's much easier to have community there and have the festivals and everything else. Uh, new, and then we have um, Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Connecticut. And even in Florida, to where the population, a lot of the population has been moving, we see the population congregating. My sister moved to Orange County, and uh, now there is a Portuguese club, and uh, pretty soon there's going to be feasts and that sort of thing. Uh, I did a, a survey of Portuguese Americans for PELCUS, the Portuguese American Leadership Council. It's not a representative survey. However, it provides very valuable data in the sense that it is the only source of data that we have that allows us to see what's going on from generation to generation. Census data and the American Community Survey, uh, they have data for people born in Portugal, but then they don't have data for the second generation, the third generation, the great-grandchildren, and so forth. About uh, four... 1468 respondents uh, represent, um, they uh, responded. And as you can see, about 82% of them said that they live in Portuguese communities. This is good for diaspora, right? Although we're spreading, we still are living within communities. That means we can still maintain our culture there and, uh, and um, maintain our organizations and so forth. Now, within the survey, I, I asked them, uh, what their biggest challenges in their Portuguese communities were, and although maintaining ties to Portugal, uh, getting youth um, and maintaining Portuguese culture were there, the main challenges for them were um, the um, maintaining the Portuguese language and maintaining community organizations, getting the next generations involved in the community organizations that were created by the immigrant. Uh, generation. Uh, these concerns are very important for diaspora maintenance. Knowing the ancestral language allows one to participate in the culture of the homeland and facilitates transnationalism. And um, so uh, not only that, but studies have shown that when someone studies another language, they, their identity changes, their identity begins to adopt aspects of the country of that language. So ma the maintenance of the ethno identity that's very important for diaspora is also tied to the Portuguese language. Now, community organizations are critical for the maintenance of a distinct community, which is also essential. If not, there's just gonna be assimilation. And uh, in the open-ended questions to the survey, people that were involved in community organizations expressed a tremendous amount of preoccupation with this idea that these organizations might fade away because they were having difficulty in getting the new generations involved. So that's not really that good um, So um, for, the, uh, for diaspora theory. Now I wanna go over a little bit of uh, integration. Classical assimilation theory, you'd um, argue that 
integration into the US mainstreams educational and economic institutions, you'd lead to other types of assimilation. That is, as people study and work together, they fall in love and the birds and the bees take over. And then those birds and bees lead us to become biologically, culturally, and psychologically diluted into the vast American mainstream. Uh, diaspora theory, you'd however, argue that socioeconomic res that having a higher level of socioeconomic resources allows one to engage in more diaspora building activities, travel to Portugal, which is not cheap, investments in Portugal, again, the connections to the homeland. Um, I'm going to skip this one and go to this slide on education. The slide shows the level of education of different categories of Portuguese Americans and also in comparison to all Americans. As you can see, all the Luso descendants are very close to all Americans. That's within the margin of error. One moment, please. Among Portuguese Americans, immigrants have the lowest level of education. And then that's followed by Port Luso descendants that are Portuguese on both sides of the family and then uh, those that have mixed ancestry. And then the immigrants, the Luso descendant immigrants that are coming from other areas of the Portuguese diaspora have a very high level of, of education. But before you think that's really high, you need to compare it to the levels of education for uh, an Asian American groups where 57% of the entire population has a bachelor's degree or higher. In any case, the overall level of education is high. This was just to show that um, the level of education for Portuguese Americans increased at a higher level than for all Americans. A different um, um, source of data, so there's, the figures are uh, slightly uh, higher. In terms of occupation, the first row includes the vast American middle class in stable forms of employment for, which, for most of which uh, education is needed. This includes people like university professors, doctors, business owners, managers, etc. And the last two rows represent the traditional blue-collar occupations uh, that uh, immigrants generally were involved in. And as you can see, the immigrant, immigrants from Portugal have the highest representation in the traditional blue-collar occupations, uh, whereas in the, the vast middle class, um, the um, ones born in other areas of the Portuguese diaspora have a higher level of, of representation, and then the different categories of Luso descendants born in the US are also slightly higher um, than the American average. Again, it shows occupational integration as well. I did look at um, ownership <laughs> or, or self-employment, and actually it's the people from the other areas of the diaspora that have the highest level of self-employment, about almost 20% of them are self-employed as well. Uh, so moving on, uh, uh, household and family income, let's just look at um, family income uh, and uh, it's higher for all the different categories of Portuguese Americans than it is for all Americans. Now, uh, the, the birds and the bees <laughs> take, take over as this integration happened. And I just, there's just a, a warning from Tololian. He is one of the major diaspora theorists that to be a diaspora, an ethnic community must survive across at least three generations. Uh, and uh, so um, let's, wait a minute, I went too far. Okay, let's just look at the numbers that are highlighted in black. And as you can see, of single ancestry among the Luso descendants born in the United States, only 33% have Portuguese ancestry, 33% have Portuguese ancestry in, on both sides. These, you know, and I ask myself, like for example, my own grandchildren, they are fourth Portuguese. So why would they even identify as Portuguese? And they probably would put Portuguese as their first ancestry, because even though they only a fourth Portuguese, on the mother's side, it's a slew of ancestries. It's Irish, English, and so forth. So the, the, 
the bigger one that they have is the Portuguese one. So that's why we have 63.8 that indicate Portuguese as the first ancestry. Now let's move on to uh, the Portuguese language. Again, an element in maintaining uh, ethno um, identity, ethno national identity. And we can see that um, the both the um, number and the percentage of uh, both immigrants from Portugal and Luso descendants born in the United States as declined. So among the Luso descendants born in the United States from 2005 to 2021, it went from 9.2 or to 7.6. Uh, and um, so it's a decline. You might have heard of a, a recent study that claimed that it had increased a lot, but that was because they uh, missed mentioning the, uh, the immigration from the other areas of the Portuguese diaspora where people arrive in the United States, they are Luso descendants, born in Brazil, born in other parts of the world. English is not their first language, so they speak Portuguese at home. Uh, now, who's uh, speaking Portuguese? Mostly Portuguese immigrants, the people from the other areas of the Portuguese diaspora. There's a huge variety of language that um, people from other areas of the diaspora speak, from Parsi, from uh, African languages, from um, various Asian languages uh, that they speak at home. And keep in mind, this is speak at home. And as you can see, when you come, we come to mixed ancestry and Portuguese as a second ancestry, it's almost gone. In the survey, we asked people to rate their perceived speaking, Portuguese speaking skills. And as you can see, across the generations, there's a tremendous decline. But this is in line with the studies that have been done of um, immigrants in the United States and their descendants that by the, the generation of the grandchildren, only one to 3% speak the ancestral language. Uh, uh, Two minutes, no. <laughs> uh, now, connections to Portugal. I, in my two minutes, I really want to emphasize the issue of citizenship. You know, we, a few decades ago, we began emphasizing people getting citizenship in the United States. I think now it's time to emphasize getting Portuguese citizenship among the uh, Port Portuguese descendants. And the reason is, is that I really think that in terms of identity, my son just got his citizenship card this summer and he was elated that if we really want to develop a Portuguese identity among our children, let's give them citizenship. But the process is extremely difficult. If you don't live near a consulate, it has to be through the embassy in, in Washington, DC. And so if I live, um, let's, let's say, in Washington state, I don't think we have a consulate there, I'm going to go to the other coast to seek my uh, inter uh, um, citizenship. And it's a bureaucratic process uh, that is very expensive. Now, participation in Portuguese elections is minimal, even by the immigrant generation. That could be changed. Uh, visits to Portugal. The immigrant generation visits quite a bit, but you see the decline among the generations. Uh, ownership in Portugal is, um, among those uh, 1,500 people, is minimal. Um, investments are minimal. We do have a lot of trans-state networks connecting the various Portuguese diasporas com communities across the world. Uh, you can read them over there. We do elect four representatives, although most of us do not vote. And then the conclusions, uh, let me go into this one, is basically the diaspora, the Portuguese diaspora, is thriving right now. We have very, a very rich Portuguese American culture. Will it survive beyond the three, the three generations that Tolian talks about? about? It might if um, the first generations are successful in passing the mantle to their children and grandchildren and efforts from Portuguese from Portugal continue to be exerted. And I emphasize Portuguese uh, citizenship. I'm, I'm very happy to see Paukas taking an initiative of promoting Portuguese citizenship 
among um, for, uh, the descendants. So. <laughs> Bon dia. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, so uh, I'm going to just bore you by talking for 15 minutes. Uh, but I think Dulce actually did finish three minutes early, so it should be 18. Uh, thank you again. Muito obrigado. Um, thanks to the organization for the invite. Uh, thanks to Antonio Monteiro and his whole staff for being outstanding. And um, a special uh, also thanks to the... Uh, uh, municipality of Santa Maria here in the in, in the village, which is uh, the municipality, has been doing great work. And uh, a special mention to a couple of uh, friends, but at the same time uh, representing important institutions. All of you are representing important institutions, but that is flat uh, with uh, Professor Elsa Nihikus and their um, commitment to Fresno State. Um, she's been a champion. She's been a uh, what we call a uh, uh, one of the cheerleaders, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, our, our work at Fresno State, and I appreciate that. And, um, and, and uh, my very good friend, Professor Carlos Amaral, here representing the government of the Azores, but I like to also refer to him as the Catedratic with University. Forget the government, that's all temporary. Anyway, as all governments are, independently how long they run. So um, the dream that uh, you were denied, uh, the Zorian diaspora, and I, it, it kind of follows what uh, Jules was saying. I uh, congratulate her on her work, which has been very, very important for our communities. Thank you for your hard work. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of the uh, theoretical aspect and just to let you, and, uh, but I will give you a little bit of it, so I'm going to skip around a little bit, to go to the end, which uh, I think uh, are the action items that I'd like to leave at this conference. So a few years ago, Time Magazine uh, uh, had a special issue dedicated to multiculturalism in the United States. This is several years ago before we even talked about multiculturalism. It was still the melting pot idea, if many of you may recall, still is basically. Uh, the cover uh, was uh, made up of a mixed race woman with the headline, The Face of America. And this uh, woman was both familiar and exotic with a uh, placid smile and an ambiguous face. And we were looking at someone who according to the American magazine uh, could be found in any metropolitan area such as Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. And a curious mix of Asian, Middle East, Africa, the Mediterranean, Latin America, European features. The Time Magazine model was, of course, not a real person. Uh, it was a creation, and even before artificial intelligence was as uh, it is today. So it was quite a task for Time. Uh, a computer-created image uh, through the metamorphosis of men and women from various races and ethnic groups. Times editors explained that this was a foretaste of the fruits emerging from a multicultural society, one where Azorians and their descendants have been a part of for two centuries. The magazine's cover capture, captivated an essential truth about America at the beginning of the millennium. This was around 2000. Today, uh, the United States increasingly is a diverse country, a hybrid society, a nation of many cultures and of bizarre extremes. However, and despite all vulgar things said and debated about the melting pot, the human mosaic, the rainbow coalitions, and concerns about the so-called browning of America, uh, miscegenation, at least in its fullest, that is, an open, uncomplicated cross between different races and cultures has changed the American face, not just in the metropolitan areas, but all over uh, America. And just a side note, for example, someone told me the other day that there are now more Spanish language radio stations in Oklahoma than country music stations. That tells you something uh, about America. And so historically, the experiences of ethnic groups in the U.S. begin with separation. In other words, little participation of the immigrant in the new culture and almost a strict adherence to the culture of origin, gradually metamorphosing into integration, participating in the new culture and preserving some aspects of the culture of origin. Uh, with the inevitable acculturation coming from the mainstream, 
and concluding, almost always, in assimilation or even an extreme acculturation in which the descendants of immigrants actively participate in a new culture with very few or no references to the culture of their ancestors, ending up in losing some fundamental elements of their own identity. Like their counterparts from other parts of the world, the Azorians uh, and the Azorian immigrants kept many elements of their culture and exceptionally participated in the dominant culture. With time uh, and their children, assimilation, of course, integration came, even for the immigrant community. It's just that now, in addition to recreating their homeland, maintaining the elements of the popular culture, the processions of their favorite saints and many other traditions and festivals, immigrants, particularly those who left the Azores at a young age, before high school, for example, um, have begun, began a process uh, of uh, becoming much more Americanized, uh, whatever that term means, um, uh, through their children. And because their children's participation in school activities became something that my generation didn't happen. We used to go to the Portuguese uh, clubs, whether we liked it or not, but it was uh, our parents let us go to those things. Uh, and my sons did not have that issue. You know, they participated in everything from baseball to all the other things, you know. Uh, so all of a sudden, baseball games and a few soccer games, uh, ballet recitals, uh, youth theater performances, end of school potlucks, replace the Sueca tournaments and the weekly Shamarita dances. Um, and sometimes at these potlucks, even we were lucky enough to have some Maso Suvada or Linguis or Malasadas. The second generations, of course, became totally assimilated. Um, and some cases, even the, these Portuguese delicacies disappeared, no longer bacalhau on Christmas Eve, but the American steak, which uh, probably many, American, many Portuguese Americans like better nowadays. And um, assimilation was nearly impossible without some sort of dilution, which happened in immigrants who left the Azores, especially with high illiteracy rates and with solid economic reasons. Um, from, for many of their offspring, a step toward assimilation was a step away from the culture of origin, being bicultural in the United States, belonging entirely to two different or two or more cultures, still happens to a very tiny percentage of immigrants. It's still an elite, a cultural elite, and including the Portuguese Americans. Um, having said that, one can honestly look at today's Azorian diaspora in the U.S. as a community many made up of second, third, and fourth generations, and uh, Professor Dulce, um proves that, as you saw. Albeit at times lacking in cultural awareness of the land of their forefathers, but deeply proud of their ancestral roots and eager to contribute to a new era in the relationship between the Azores and the United States. This so-called new diaspora, totally integrated into the American mainstream, can really bridge the Azores of the 21st century and all the bridges that I believe can and should be created with the U.S., Americans of Azorian ancestry have a crucial soft power that can be considered by those with responsibilities in connecting in these two worlds, the world of this uh, archipelago with less than 250,000 people and the nearly 750,000 living in the United States who are of Azorian ancestry, so three times the population of the Azores. But a new paradigm in that relationship with the diaspora is of equal importance. So in the last three years, because of the pandemic, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University, Fresno, where I work, uh, hosted a series of online conferences um, on the Portuguese American experience, featuring presentations, featuring panels uh, from young people to senior citizens, from academics to community leaders, from educators to entrepreneurs, from poets and writers to electronic engineers, from politicians um, to techn technological gurus, from students to cultural activists. PBBI. Uh, promoted also uh, three different symposiums in the last year, uh, three years, called Filaments of the Atlantic Heritage, which is a resurgence of something that existed in person in the 1990s in, in that part of the world, bringing folks uh, from these backgrounds and others, not just from the diaspora, but in this case also from the islands. Although from different latitudes and various cultural professional experiences, the remarks, requests, ideas, and desires were very, very similar. And from those conclusions of those literally dozens of events, as I'm going to present to you what 
uh, were the major conclusions, and I hope I have enough time to all of them. I'll read like my friend Onesimo Almeida at 175 miles an hour. So develop a plan uh, to use the com new communication of platforms to bring the Azores and the diaspora closer together, as well as diaspora communities with panels, presentations, debates, and conferences in Portuguese and English on the Azorean identity and the needs for a continue or the need for a continuous and fruitful contact with the autonomous region and what is being done to here, uh, here right now in this conference, live streaming it is a perfect example. We can reach the community in many different ways and live streaming is, is superb besides then it's archived and people can go to it at uh, other times. And we have that, I, you know, I was, when we were on uh, just in-person events, I was lucky to have a university event and all of the, you know this, you know, with an academic event. And sometimes I would be lucky to have 85, 95, 100 people, which is a record, considering I've been to many, you know, with six or seven. But uh, online, I, you know, our events have been reaching sometimes 1,500, 1,800 people with engagement, which is great, with engagement. Establish new active memorandums of understanding between the diaspora the diaspora's most vigorous associations and Portuguese study centers at American universities and government entities, regional munis municipal and civil society so that new talent in the contemporary arts of the Azores can reach the new generations of Azorean descendants and the American world. The popular culture in the diaspora is there to stay. I mean, it's not, it's going to stay. Okay. The factors are going to stay. They may be different, but they're going to stay. We have 14, Portuguese marching bands in California. We don't need one from the Azores to go there. But if they want to pay their way to go there, fantastic. But for the government to invest in something that we have in, in, the, in the diaspora, in the abundance, and in good quality, because most of our directors of our bands have bachelor's and master's and PhD in musical theory. So they're, they're actually very, very good at what they do. Um, so... We urgently suggest that these regional entities encourage the agreement of protocols and the sharing of responsibilities of the associated movements in the diaspora so that there are fewer isolated short-range projects and more common long-range projects with much more significant impact. Regularly promotes the image of the new Azores and the contemporary daily life, even the dilemmas, even the challenges that some of us were talking about at the dinner table yesterday. To the younger generations, with the Azorian public television utilizing something that is so common, I, I think our RTP left, but something that's so common, which is subtitles. You don't, we don't expect the Azorian RTP to, to speak in, in, in English, obviously, but the, they can be subtitled. Americans now do subtitles, thanks to Netflix. They didn't do that very well 30 years ago. Uh, they really didn't. I could tell you, even in, at the uh, classroom, sometimes you present some, some subtitles and the students would be like this, you know. Now it's natural. So, subtitles. And even here in the region, why not subtitle? So, the tourists to the region, instead of tuning in, with all due respect, to CNN, but CNN Portugal is better, to CNN, uh, and then, you know, they can tune in to uh, the Azores, to the national. Uh, to seek notícias or any of the other ones and with the subtitles so they can follow along and that way they can see what's going on in Portugal and not just uh, parts of the world. Generate digital teaching packages with the Azorian contact for Portuguese um, language and cultural classes in the American schools. Uh, especially in the West Coast, as Dulce pointed out, it's mostly Azorians. There is nothing on the Azorian culture um, uh, that is done. We need to have... Packages that teachers, you know, teachers are hardworking people, but we have a lot of stuff to do. The average high school teacher in California has 198 students, okay? And so <laughs> it's tough to develop new things all the time. You know, so papinga tafeta, there it goes, okay? So the English language must not be a barrier to bring the Azores, um, to bring the generations of Azorean descendants closer to the archipelago. Uh, and so I believe that these multicultural weeks that are done in schools with an Azorian package on that, um, in the state of California and other states of the union, I think Massachusetts is the same, by 2025, every single high school student has to have a one-year ethnic studies course in, in California. And hopefully so goes California, so goes the nation. Um, and that means that there should there, there should be a presence of the Portuguese and the Azorian 
uh, if we don't construct that, uh, it, the, the mainstream society won't say, oh, by the way, we have to include at least one week to teach about the Azorians here. They won't do it. Um, incite a renewed dialogue between cultural and social associations in the diaspora and the various states of the Union with a new generation through the American mainstream, using, of course, technology and formats that allow a more significant presence of what we call, and throughout this whole uh, last three years, people kept on calling the Azorian spirit, not just as in the SATA you know, slogan. Set up uh, more exchanges in the world of education, both at secondary and university levels, using exister, existing city, sister city programs between the Azorian municipalities and their counterparts in the U.S. This would not only give new life to sister city programs that have been kind of uh, uh, moody bundish, but uh, a renewed constant contact uh, at the secondary level and more significant opportunities for university education, including classes that are interconnected with the new technologies. And of course, this is be important for the autonomous region with lots of participation, hopefully from both institutions, the, univer the, uh, the university setting in the United States and the University of the Azores, as well as FLAD through the SIPN program uh, and, and many other uh, organizations that could partner up. Produce more investment opportunities. Two minutes. Okay, that means four. Thank you. So produce, no, I'm just kidding. Produce more investment opportunities for small and medium investors, such as an investment association that can channel funds from the Azores, from families who, through small and medium-sized investments, which is ver are very popular in the U.S., could do secure ventures, uh, secure economic ventures here in the islands. Not everybody has... $10 million to invest, but a lot of people have 150 or 200,000. Create an alliance of writers and poets of the Azorian diaspora to promote literary works of the younger generation um, and uh, at, at both levels, and of course, more translations. We're trying to do that at Fresno State with Bruma Publications and the Kagaho Colloquium. And sustain an increase uh, in, as, as I said, in translation of literary works and increase the presence of these literary works at uh, book fairs. Maybe we can't be for the first time at the Los Angeles Book Fair, but we can be at the Salinas Book Fair that has about, you know, uh, which is next to Steinbeck's home. So it has uh, it has about 150,000 people that go to it. I mean, maybe the two million to go to the LA one, but we can be at regional book fairs with the presence of Azorian literature in the translation. Improve access to the autonomous region for entrepreneurs and financial leadership. And there's a lot of thing there. And since I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip the other five things. So that they were very important, though. So uh, and and go to the last, which would be something that I believe we need urgently, which is in the Zorian Diaspora Forum, a think tank that would bring together seasoned and academic and young academics, political entities, entrepreneurs, artists to entice a dialogue and unleash the multiple potentials of the diaspora and the Azores as a unified builder of the Azorian spirit, building coalitions and networks to strengthen the Azorian soft power in the United States, forging multicultural, cross-border, and cross-class alliances. The Azorian diaspora forum should be multidisciplinary and engage in three main areas of integrated work, such as bringing a new paradigm of the Azores and the diaspora relations. Without that, we're condemned to what uh, uh, Dul said there, the past second generation. There has to be a new paradigm for these things to continue. Number two, reframe the debate of the cultural, political, economic, and security issues that affect the Azores and the diaspora. And number three, build strategic alliance to strengthen the Azores through an act of diaspora. An Azorian diaspora forum should address this work through education, advocacy, activities in regional, national, and international forums. An Azorian diaspora forum should aim not just to develop a list of new policy solutions, but to reframe the basic terms in which the public debate about the Azores and its crucial diaspora occur. An Azorian diaspora forum should stimulate public discussion and debate on both sides of the Atlantic and the Pacific while creating an informed citizenry that can craft a new vision of action for the future. We owe it to the Azores. We owe it to the diaspora. End with a quote from um, as the new voyages of discoveries and the new wave between the Azores and the diaspora must intertwine tradition with innovation. The dream denied, the phrase I used, paraphrasing Azorian poet Peter de Silveira from one of his great poems, uh, Exodus, 
can be revived in a new groundbreaking, inclusive and forward thinking format. And I think an Azorian diaspora forum would be that. Winston Churchill once said, without tradition, arts is a flock of sheep, without a shepherd, without innovation, it's a corpse. The proposals and audacious are maybe a bit audacious, but come from the community forums uh, held in the last three years with a heavy hand of younger, educated Americans with Azorian roots who undoubtedly can rise to the challenge. Thank you so much. And now for our last uh, speaker in this panel, Professor Daniela Mello. I think we are going back some 40 years. And, but some 50 look, years almost. <laughs> some 50 years almost, exactly. And continue to look at the, at the diaspora. Muito bem. Bem, mais uma vez, obrigada pelo convite. Um, este é um tema que eu comecei a trabalhar só este verão. Uh, aliás, comecei a trabalhá-lo porque tive a oportunidade de trabalhar para esta conferência. Há muito tempo que penso... Why am I speaking in Portuguese? I'm sorry. It just code switching. <laughs> so, wow, thank you. Um, I was really not even um, so. Once again, so <laughs> so thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. Um, I have worked on topics of U.S. foreign policy during the Portuguese Revolution and mobilization. Um, I started, actually, my dissertation was on women's mobilization during the Portuguese Revolution. Um, and in, in researching those topics, of course, I've come across a lot of information about Portuguese Americans and what they were doing as well. And I always wanted an excuse to sort of dive into this. And this was it. <laughs> okay. So um, this is also to say that I am really looking forward to some comments <laughs> on how to improve upon this, because it is very much on its early stages. But I found a lot of information. This is also the typical example of uh, political scientists going in and thinking, I have a neat little article here and figuring out that this could be a book easily, right? There's so much information out there that still needs to be worked. So I started with um, three basic questions. So did the Portuguese diaspora seek to influence US foreign policy towards Portugal during the revolution? Yes. Um, how did the Portuguese diaspora in New England, in particular, this is my starting point, uh, where Azorians are a vast majority, articulate community interests in the U.S. via the developments in Lisbon and in the Azores between 74 and 76, right? And then I also looked at what forms of organized behavior were present, what were their demands, their targets, their goals, what strategies and tactics were pursued. Um, I'm using the, the definition of diaspora that is very common in international relations, <laughs> in U.S. foreign policy studies that look at diaspora. This is from Shane and Barth. Uh, diaspora is a people with a common origin who reside more or less on a permanent basis outside the borders of their ethnic and religious homeland. Uh, diaspora members identify themselves or are identified by others as part of the homeland's national community and as such are often called upon to participate and are entangled in homeland-related affairs. The Portuguese certainly fit this, Portuguese Americans certainly fit this um, definition. So I'll spend a little bit of time here about my argument, which is also kind of my finding so that I don't have to do it at the end, <laughs> and I'll sort of end with the examples. Um, so what I found uh, in this preliminary analysis is that Portuguese diasporic elites in New England mobilized large segments of the population to influence the path of U.S. foreign policy towards Lisbon and towards the Azores in particular. So diasporic elites truly acted as transnational actors during the Portuguese Revolution. Uh, they acted as bridges and moderators between the Azores, between Lisbon, and between um, the United States, and the United States government, and 
Portuguese American communities. They also position themselves as safeguarding the national interests of both the homeland and the host nation. And to a certain extent, for those seeking Azorian independence, the national interest or the emerging national interest of an Azorian nation, of a potential Azorian state. So it's, it's a really complex picture uh, that they're painting there. So some advocated and mobilized for Azorian self-determination and most effectively, and this is why I highlighted this point there, there were some diasporic elites that activated networks and used constituency politics within the United States to their utmost advantage. As you will see, the diaspora got itself all the way up into the White House, into the Oval Office, <laughs> right, during the Portuguese Revolution. So this is an incredible, I mean, there are many measures of success, but it's an incredible measure of success of being able to actually speak to um, the kingmakers of U.S. foreign policy, right? So the last thing that I want to highlight here is that Azorians in the U.S., uh, I call this a minority-majority situation because in the Portuguese-American community in New England and in California, as we heard, Azorians are the vast majority, <laughs> right? So Azorian identity really... Um, has an, is an oversight, has an oversized role in, um, within Portuguese identity and what we consider Portuguese in the United States. So Azorians in the US filtered their understanding of developments in Lisbon through their Azorian and American lenses. And as a result, what I found is that three points. One, we have an amplification of Azorian interests over mainland interests in the diasporic media of the period. Two, um, they really fostered uh, the, the fact that there's so many Azorians and that the media is paying so much attention to what's happening in the Azores. There's far better coverage on that side of the Atlantic of what's happening in, in the Azores during the Portuguese Revolution than there is in Lisbon, <laughs> right? Um, so Azor, this really fosters that imagined community that... that um, that this is a common term to talk about diasporas, the imagination that is a transnational nation of Azorians beyond the borders of the archipelago. And finally, uh, the diaspora is going to provide economic and intellectual resources to the Azores independence movement, right? So again, it's, it's a truly complex um, political process that we're talking about here. So the primary sources that I looked at um, for this particular presentation, I used the Ferreira Mendes Portuguese American Archive at UMass Dartmouth. Um, I looked at the Portuguese Times because the Portuguese Times was the most widely read newspaper during the period. And I look at the Joseph Fernandes collection, which will become obvious why once you see the pictures. I also looked at plenty of correspondence between, um, in the National Archives between the U United States Council in Punta Delgada and the State Department and between the Lisbon um, Embassy, Carlucci, who's our ambassador in 1975, um, and the State Department. There's a lot more information to be mined, though. This is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more media, for instance, to look at um, in the diaspora during this period. Um, I won't spend time, you know, I don't have time to talk about the literature, but there is a robust literature about diasporic politics in the United States. It is a very typical form of political activism, of ethno-national activism in the United States. And there's also a fairly robust scholarship within international relations about how diasporas organize to influence U.S. foreign policy. And again, the Portuguese case is deeply understudied. <laughs> in fact, I, um, I couldn't find one single study published out there about the Portuguese and U.S. foreign policy. Uh, maybe this will be the first one. But if there is one, let me know because I want to include it. But what do you, yeah, I don't think there is. I, I spent quite a lot of time looking. Um, but there's two things that I want to emphasize from, um, from the scholarship that I used to also as a framework to analyze the Portuguese case. The first one is thinking about what is it that actually allows ethnic communities to mobilize in this way to try to influence U.S. foreign policy towards other countries, towards their, host, uh, their homelands, right? Um, and, and what makes it possible? And the literature um, 
I'm going to summarize it in two terms, speaks about capacity on one hand and opportunity on the other. So in terms of capacity, are there diasporic leaders that are ready to activate and mobilize the community? Are there spaces for mobilization? Uh, and is there a strong diasporic media that can spread and amplify issues within the community, but also inform the community about what's happening in the homeland? Right, so this this is about capacity. The other one is opportunity. Um, does the political system of the host nation allow for this type of political activism? And the United States absolutely does. Um, and in looking at the United States, um, the issue of, of constituency politics, the fact that the United States is so decentralized um, that the state. The fact that it's so decentralized and divided into constituencies that really make um, the re-election of state representatives, state senators, national representatives, national dependent on that community continuing to support them, right, really lands itself really well for ethnic groups to be able to really mobilize those individuals, use them as access points to power, right? That use them as leverage to actually get the interests of the community uh, to be heard in Washington. Okay, so having said that, let's go to the examples and some of the images that I brought for you today. The Portuguese Americans in the 1970s definitely have all of these elements, right? They are ripe for political mobilization during the revolution. They have widespread media, lots of newspapers, radio stations, television channels, and programs. You have here is still, if you recognize, with Spinola about to be interviewed um, in a channel in New England. We have social and cultural clubs, hundreds and hundreds of them um, in New England. And we have churches with politically engaged priests. The Portuguese Times, which is the newspaper that I looked most in depth at uh, for this particular research, follows the developments in Portugal with, with incredible detail, <laughs> okay? Um, and and this, is, uh, this is typical and to be expected, um, we also see that the Portuguese Times changes its coverage with the change in political developments in Lisbon. Right, So we unfortunately don't have time to unpack the two years of the Portuguese revolution here, but we had six provisional governments and four of those six provisional governments were led by Vasco Gonçalves, who is widely believed to be a communist. Right, And anti-communism was really one of the strong flags of Portuguese Americans in the United States and of Azorians, right? And it was great, great concern by the Portuguese Times that communists were really taking over the government in Lisbon. And you can really see this in, you know, throughout the pages of the Portuguese Times. I put multiple examples. Um, also very, very positive um, coverage of individuals who became quite controversial in Portugal during the Portuguese Revolution, like Spinola <laughs> or Galvão de Melo. Uh, so individuals who were believed to be involved with the 11 March, you know, coup attempt, um, with the, the September 28th, you know, silent majority ma that led to Spinola to, you know, leave the presidency and be replaced by Costa Gomes. So, the editorial team in the, in the United States really adopts this incredibly strong anti-communist position against provisional governments and the armed forces movement, and in fact tries to organize, oh, I, sorry, the sentence I just noticed doesn't end, try to organize the community <laughs> with letter writing campaigns, actually printing, this is how you write to your senator, here's the sample language, here's the address of your, you know, state representatives and whatnot. And here you have the examples of two major demonstrations that happened organized by ad hoc com uh, committees, um, in co ad hoc committees formed in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Jersey to bring Portuguese people to Washington and to New York at key points. This were uh, in April of 1975, when Portugal was getting ready for the first elections for the Constituent Assembly, and the community was very deeply engaged in 
you know, wanting the communists to not win this particular election and wanting both the United Nations and, um, and Washington, right, and, and the political leadership in Washington to put pressure in the Portuguese government to support the moderates. Oh, by the way, the first demonstration, the one at the UN, brought 3,000 people to New York to demonstrate at the UN. The second one in Washington brought 5,000 people to Washington. Okay. I won't spend too much time on social and cultural clubs, only to say that, again, these are critical resources um, to be able to organize and mobilize politically because they provide spaces <laughs> Uh, for people to congregate and for individuals to come and to speak to the communities. So you have multiple examples here, actually, of PPD leaders and PS leaders um, who came to tour the Portuguese American communities to try to inform them about the developments in Portugal and about the platforms of their parties, right? And it's the social clubs that um, are hosting a lot of this sessões de esclarecimento is what they used to call them during the period. I also found quite a bit of information um, about churches and the space churches being used, particularly with the Zorian independence, right, to um, host events, uh, to gather um, money, fundraise, to fundraise for Azorian independence. And you actually have a picture of Father Reinaldo Cardoso, who was born in Fayal, was a priest in Rhode Island for most of his life. Um, speaking <laughs> at one of these events, right? And manifesting himself, that's a quote from him, right? Manifesting himself pro-independence, uh, talking about himself as a political asylum uh, seeker in the United States. So it's, it's really a fascinating um, angle that I also need to further explore because there's multiple examples out there of priests also helping to mobilize the community for Azorian independence in particular. So um, I will now speak a little bit about New England Portuguese American organizations. I absolutely love that picture up top. Um, this organization, Movimento Portugal Livre da Nova Inglaterra, that changed its name later to Os Amigos da Comunidade de Língua Portuguesa, um, really organized itself very early on in 1974 um, and was then joined by another group called Comité da de Ação Democrática de Fall River. They, they sort of merged um, to try to address these issues for the community. Counselor representation, they wanted Ambassador Tamido to be sent home, they didn't trust him, and they wanted electoral rights for the diaspora in the Constitutional Assembly. And in 1974, this was a major issue within the community. And they actually went door to door in New England, registering people uh, to vote in the elections for the Constituent Assembly. Um, and managed to, um, to get you know, thousands of people to sign up, um, who, who qualified to sign up for the election. An important point here, I um, hope I'm not speaking too fast, I'm trying to get through a lot of information. Um, so I will speak even faster. Um, <laughs> but, um, so I will, actually, I'll leave that interesting point for our lunch conversations when, and if you're interested in that. There are also very specifically Azores-oriented organizations that were active in New England, and if you're familiar with this period, you will be familiar with these organizations, right? We have MAPA, Movimento para a Autodeterminação do Povo Suriano, MIA, Movimento para a Independência dos Açores, and then we have, and these are the ones that I'll focus the most on, FLA, a Frente Libertação dos Açores, and Comité Suriano 75, right? That was created, um, in Massachusetts um, for the purpose of fundraising for FLA across the Azorian communities. Um, there's, these are segments from, um, segments from telegrams from the State Department and from the U.S. Consulate in Ponta Delgada about meeting with representatives from MIA and from MAPA. And I highlighted them because they show very clearly how intentional it was to actually seek Azorians in the Portuguese American community for funding, fundraising purposes in particular, right? For extra political leverage. Now, FLA 
also um, did a major demonstration in Washington. Uh, these are pictures of that demonstration, demonstrations primarily in front of the State Department. Um, they brought about 750 people, is what the media covered, came down to Washington to protest for Azorian independence at the peak of the hot summer, right? This is when the situation in Portugal is at its most stressful, when there's fears of um, even a potential civil war, when there's a lot of, there's a spike in the violence um, against communists and against the far left uh, in areas like the Azores and the north of Portugal. There's, there, there's a clear sense, sorry, there's a clear sense uh, and, and a lot of fear from the point of view of the United States government as well, uh, that the moderates are losing ground in the provisional government, right? So FLA, this is also the height of FLA's mobilization in the United States. Um, they really use that fear of communism in Portugal, uh, the idea that, um, that the Azores are being ripped off by the mainland, sort of economic grievances, anti-communist grievances, uh, and religious grievances, right, are really used to mobilize uh, the community for this, you know, red scare, basically, coming from Lisbon. And the FLA's wings are going to be clipped, if I may, by the 25th of November, <laughs> right? Um, and you see that also quite clearly, and that's also a really interesting um, aspect of this. I'm going to beg for another minute yeah. okay. <laughs> um, to talk about this individual in particular. This, you are seeing pictures here of Mr. Joseph Fernandes of Fernandes Supermarkets <laughs> across New England, visiting President Nixon with uh, Senator Kennedy and with other, a much younger Senator Kennedy in the 60s in the third picture uh, and other um, illustrious members of the Portuguese community all surrounding the Senator for this particular picture. And this is to tell you about the importance of uh, these networks and, and pulling these levers in order to be able to access power. Because, and this is my last picture, uh, that's Joseph Fernandes right there, right? In a private meeting on September 11, 1975, within the Oval Office. In the center between Fernandes and Ford is Heckler who was a, representative, a Republican representative from Massachusetts who brokered the meeting into the Oval Office. And I took some segments uh, from that discussion, from the minutes of that discussion, that spoke quite specific, that, that showed very well, and I think very clearly, how much Heckler was trying to be responsive to the Azorians within her electoral district, right? And she frames the entire discussion with uh, President Ford from her perspective about, you know, how important this is to the Azorian community that I represent, how important this is uh, to the Azorians in my district. So I don't have any more time. Uh, I will just say that uh, there's a lot of further research to be done. Connections with California. Uh, this is a segment of Comité Asurien being, you know, sending um, representatives to California to fundraise there. Canada is an other angle because Comité Asturian 75 is also very active in Canada, other diaspora media sources and the levels of fundraising. I don't have any data on that. So thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me to go a few minutes over. <laughs> Um, do, we see, do we still have time for some Q&A? Okay, so I give the word to the audience, maybe collecting some questions. To me first, Anna Monica after. Uh, can you just wait for the mic? Otherwise, the... Uh, yes, for, for Denise Bosch, we're all dying to know what the other five uh, very important proposals were. So please, if you could indulge us. And then for uh, Daniela. So... A lot of people here, they lost out, right? Um, how, how did this pan out? Like, what was the fallout? Have you looked into, like, political fallout? Did these people continue to agitate after it was clear that they lost their fight? Yes. Great. Uh, Anna Monica? 
let's collect just two or three. Uh, thank you so much. What's uh, uh, another interesting, very interesting and uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, panel? Obviously, my question is for Daniela. I would not, obviously, because I work on this <laughs> on this period, so I am very uh, curious. I, I have a lot of questions, and I want to talk to you, but we will have time. Just one very direct question regarding the Portuguese times. Uh, did you understood, or did you um, saw if they had a special? Uh, um, uh, I, um, representative in, in Portugal or they were using the agencies to have their information because you said they were very keen in uh, following up. Did they send someone to Portugal after, after a few time or uh, on the country they just was were following the, the agencies as, as usual? Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, one last question. Just one last question for Dulce. Uh, the label Latino um, how, 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 what, it, what is the, your understanding of uh, where we actually fit? And for instance, the people from Brazil, um, the label Latino. Can you tell us something about that? Oh, it's if they identify as Latinos, for the, especially the ones from, uh, from Latin America. Yeah. This, this, Thank was, you. this was very nice because we have three questions for three different <laughs> panelists. <laughs> So I will, I will ask each one of you to spend, I don't know, what, two, three minutes in your mo most in your, in your replies. And uh, maybe let's re reverse again the, the order and start with, with Daniela, sure. to whom I also had a lot of questions, but sure. we can discuss it over, <laughs> over lunch. Because I uh, work on Portuguese American, I used to work on Portuguese American relations, on Spinola, yeah. on, on <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes, you yeah. did. Well, well the, the, it's, this is not a question, but the argument of the of the of the moderates in Portugal was that radicalization and you know this kind of claims actually gave argument to the communists back in Portugal. You know, who were arguing that you know fascism was on the counter offensive, so mm -hmm. we need to mm -hmm. reinforce right. our grip in power in yeah, Portugal. Which they did. I mean, uh, they yeah. did argue. And then, and then the moderates working with Carlucci trying to convince the yeah. US government not to support Spinola and exactly. any crazy exactly. uh, right-wing attempts. Yeah, and I'll add to this that presentation, I skipped a lot of parts of my presentation for time's sake, right? But um, the US government actually maintained a very strong line of non-interference in the Azorian independence question. And in spite of all the communist accusations in Lisbon, particularly out of Lisbon left-wing newspapers that the CIA was active in Portugal, there's no evidence of this. And in fact, now that much of the much of the information has been declassified, we can see that, in fact, the Portuguese and Carlucci played the critical role here in, in throwing uh, support behind the moderate factions within the armed forces movement and trying to prop them so that they could really take charge of the, of the PREC, right? right. Um, and, uh, and they do, right, by, by the sixth provisional government. So in terms of political fallout for individuals advocating... Um, for Azorian independence. So the two individuals that I also didn't have time to talk about that are fascinating, José de Almeida and Carlos Matos, I think. So José de Almeida had, had been uh, a member of parliament um, for, during the Caetano years, right? He, so he was associated with... Um, he was associated with the previous regime, um, and he became very quickly involved with um, the independence movement once, once the coup of the 15th of Abril took place. Uh, he is one of three leaders that are sent by FLA to three places. One sent to Lisbon, he is sent to mobilize the Azorians in, um, in New England and then in California. And, uh, and there's somebody else who's, there's another cell of FLA that goes to the Canary Islands. Um, the one, José de Almeida then gets his brother-in-law, <laughs> Carlos Matos, who lived in Fall River, to start Comité Asturiano 75, 
right? And they purport to be completely separate organizations, right? One born out of the diaspora itself, uh, which it was, but with the influence of the FLA leader, who's the brother-in-law right, of, of, of Carlos Matos. And from the point in the documents from the State Department very clearly show, one, that the Americans are following the development of FLA very closely. They're deeply, they're very well informed. They have many points of access and many uh, informants, right, within FLA, telling them, and, and FLA is also trying to convince the U.S. government to support them, right? So it's not like they're being too surreptitious in their gathering of information. FLA wants to be heard by the U.S. government. The U.S. government is listening to them and keeping copious notes about, you know, uh, sabotage, bombings, uh, potential terrorist tactics, about potential plans for a coup in the Azores and what, whether the Azorean diaspora would support that or not. So there's all of this, there's this wealth of information that the State Department is keeping, but the line of the State Department is always that um, absolutely not. We, we have to be neutral on the question of Azorean independence, right, until we see where the wind blows in Lisbon. Um, so in terms of fallout for those individuals, the fallout comes within FLA itself, I would say early on. Uh, I need to do more digging into it, but José Almeida really falls out of grace by late 75. There's a lot of complaints by other cells of FLA <laughs> about his behavior, his attempt to create an independent government for the Azores in the United States apparently was not consensual within FLA. Um, so he ends up actually being, uh, inside the organization uh, undermined, and, and then that sort of spills over um, to the public scene. But I'm perhaps giving you more detail than, than you required. Uh, I'm sure there's more information to dig out here, but I haven't gotten to it yet. And the question about um, the Porsche Times. So the Porsche Times has a huge newsroom during this period. Um, they are publishing issues every week uh, sometimes with 40 extra pages <laughs> during this period. They have a newsroom, uh, I forget the exact number, but it's more than 20 people, and they actually have people that they are sending to Lisbon, reporting directly from Lisbon on those issues, but they also publish things from numerous agencies, including from Brazil, right? Like Adolf Bloch from Brazil keeps publishing every week <laughs> on their site. So it's it's actually incredible how good the coverage of the Portuguese Times is during this period, especially when we look at the state of diasporic media in the Portuguese American community right now. Um, but but they, they had capacity. Um, they, they started publishing segundo caderno e terceiro caderno even during the, in 75. So that tells you that the readership was expanding tremendously also during this period. They're publishing a byline in English and a byline in Portuguese that also starts during this period. So clearly with an intention to inform the Portuguese Americans that don't have a strong Porsche background in Portuguese even then. So it's, they're, a, a, you know, they're an important force here in shaping um, in shaping the minds of Azorian Americans in particular, or of Portuguese Americans in general, about what's happening in Lisbon and what's happening in the Azores. Thank you. Professor, please watch. Uh, the five things. Well, let me make a comment about Danielle first, because I, I one of the, uh, of the pluses of being old is you live through these things. And so <laughs> I lived through this time in the end that I went to a procession to pray for the, uh, the peace in the Azores and the anti-communism of the Azores right, okay. at a sanctuary <laughs> for Our Lady of Fatima ran by a priest who was from the island of San Miguel, um, who had been there many years. He had immigrated as a young man. So I, I, I lived through that. I was at 17. Nukumishi Dr. Almeida in Tulare, California. Uh -huh. And I had the privilege, I had the privilege of, of, to, of talking to him. So uh, I was 17, you know, I, I, my mind was on other things, not Dr. Almeida. I was made to go with my, with my parents, but, uh, but it was an experience. I remember actually enjoying the man as, uh, in a he conversation. Was apparently a good speaker. He was an excellent speaker. <laughs> Right. But he was well, yeah. But uh, but it was a very interesting man. And then and then just a little bit. So uh, and just to add, 
Antonio Alberto Costa was, of course, at the Portuguese Times at the time, who was a very right-wing man, <laughs> um, uh, who, I, who I had a discussion with when on one side said, I'm an Azorian-American. He says, you can't be an Azorian-American because there's no Azorian nationality. I said, don't try us. But anyway, that was just, you know, uh, a little bit of a thing with him. However, um, but Antonio Alberto Costa was a powerful man uh, of ideas in that community, and I thanks for bringing that up. And two other things, which were at that time also, we, there was another newspaper that began, the Azorian Times, you know, which didn't, uh, there was kind of a take on the Portuguese Times uh, by Carolina Matos, uh -huh. who has now an online, the Portuguese American Journal. And then in California, we didn't have the, the Comité, but we had something that began in opposite ends of the state, the Alianza Asuriana was influenced by José de Almeida's visit. And it was basically in San Jose, and, which is a northern Bay Area community, and in San Diego. And the interesting thing is in San Jose, because of people mainly from Fayal, a little bit from San Jorge, from all the islands, but mainly, and the other one in San, in, in San Diego, Pico, very, very strong presence. In the valley where I'm from, there was never an Alianza Georgiense because the Tercedans felt that they were still back in 1580 and we were going to be the capital again of Portugal. So we were, you know, they were, they, believe it or not, they were very anti throughout the valley, the farmers, even though they were very conservative and they still are, um, they were very anti independence. Okay, they might have believed in José de Almeida, but they were very pro-Portugal, and we need to resolve, resolve this problem. So, now, my, your question, real quick. So, the other five things are basically in that same line. That's why I skipped them. But one of them I'd like to make a comment on is holding elected officials of Azorian descent accountable. I, don't, I think we do a lousy job as a community. I think we do a lousy job as the government of the Azores, all governments, not Carlos, of course. He's exempt from that. <laughs> but um, the, uh, we all do... Uh, we have done, you know, we wine and dine them, we bring them to Portugal, to the Azores, we, you know, and then there is no homework, there's no accountability. You know, what's going to come out of this? Any good lobbyist in the United States is going to wine and dine somebody, but there's going to be a result of that, you know, the, somehow that lobbyist is going to find a way for that uh, politician to either do what he needs to be done or to pay for that lunch. Uh, no such thing as a free lunch. And so... I think we need to have a broader advocacy. We vote in the United States, and as, as uh, uh, Dulce has pointed out, uh, Portuguese Americans vote, uh, but we need to hold them accountable. Um, you know, I have a good friend of mine who is very proactive in the Portuguese American community, and he says when he hears people say, I'm proud to be Portuguese, and he's a, a politician, he'll say, great, what are you going to do for us? And so, uh, you know, if you're going to have my theory, and I lead an organization in California that is funded uh, mostly uh, by FLAD, uh, which is called California Portuguese American Coalition. But my theory is this. I, we want for Americans of Portuguese background, you know, to be elected office. But if an Hispanic is going to do a better job for the Portuguese American community, let's talk. Okay. That's a very complicated question, and it's a question of wanting to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, the label Latino, Hispanic, and so forth was created because of affirmative action, which was uh, implemented in the late 60s going into the 1970s. So uh, the government specified which groups were eligible for affirmative action. Did not include the Portuguese, but it included Hispanics and Latinos. Now, um, the Brazilians are not considered Hispanics. So to include Brazilians, particularly, particularly in the transportation area, Brazilians had to be included. So the word Portuguese speaking had to be included in the language of the, uh, the official language of the government. Um, but they initially they specified that this did not include people from Spain or from Portugal. Okay. However, Mexican businesses, Mexican American businesses, 
and Spanish business are very intertwined. So they petitioned the government to include Spain under the label of people from Spain under the label. Why? So that those businesses could be eligible for the minority 10% aside. That whenever you have a public contract, you have to give 10% of the subcontracts to minority owned and women owned businesses. So, uh, in some states, the Portuguese were actually considered the minority without having to assume the, um, the Hispanic label. Uh, so, um, the, eventually, the Portuguese were included because if you include Spain, you have to include Portugal, officially, in, in the government um, agencies. Then they were taken out for some reason, it was by accidental. Congress excluded them in, when they um, uh, funded the Small Business Administration. And there were businessmen from the Portuguese American community who wrote a letter to Congress in protest. So that's why I say it's a question of wanting your cake and eat it too. You don't, do not want to be called Hispanic because you do not want to be assess, associated with all the prejudice uh, that is, um, you know, that Hispanics nowadays feel in the United States. But you want to be Hispanic so that you can qualify for the set aside. So uh, state, the states, uh, the different states, have moved to consider Portuguese not a minority, uh, because in some states like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, you don't, didn't have to be labeled Hispanic to be considered a, a minority and then qualify for the public contract. Uh, so we're moving in the direction of not being considered Hispanic everywhere. Uh, but as I pointed out in my presentation, we have an increasing presence of Luso descendants born in Mexico, Venezuela, Cuba, et, et cetera. And they want to be considered Hispanic. And they are, but they are a minority still. But they, only, they, only, they are the only group that's growing. So <laughs> eventually, the share of people that want to be Hispanic will increase. But we did a survey again with Palkas to ask the Portuguese, it was in 2013, to ask the Portuguese, popul Portuguese American population if they wanted to be Hispanic. And the rejection was overwhelming. <laughs> and people were very angry. They didn't want to be Hispanic. And I think it has to do with their parents and grandparents already went through all that, the, the pains in, uh, of adaptation into American society, the rejection, the prejudice. So they didn't want to go through that again and be considered a minority and part of a rejected group. Uh, but that's where we are. Yeah. Thank you very much. One final thought. I just want uh, to add to, uh, to, to Dulce. But the first time now, just a few months ago, we had, through the arts, a, an anthology of contemporary uh, artists, uh, Latinx artists in the United States. And it included six Portuguese American poets that wanted to be there. So through the arts, because they want, they want to be known and they want to be, and they will be heard and their voices have been heard throughout the Hispanic, well, we prefer Latin community, the Latinx community. And through the Latinx community, then we have an audience that is that has a lot of the same issues that we had as immigrants or as sons or daughters of immigrants, first, second, or third generation. So I think through the arts, it's changing. The artistic world is more and more in tune and wants to be part of the Latinx community for many reasons, including that they are the biggest group in the U.S., Thank you very much. I think that we we just sleep like 11 minutes, so it's it's fine, it's perfect. So please join me in a final round of applause for these three wonderful presentations.